It's Monday. It's November 4th. And the word of the day is suffragium, which is Latin for fucking vote. Used in a sentence, fucking suffragium, fucking fucking vote. Yes. Yeah, I don't want to hear any of this I live in Europe bullshit. Exactly. You move to Pennsylvania, you change your name to a dead person, and you vote, damn it. <laughs> so many times. No illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And broadcasting delayed from America's Far Center, we are the Skeptocrats. On this week's episode, you want us to beg you to vote? Because we'll beg! We'll uh, beg! I'll offer you a million dollars with the exact same intention of sticking to it as Elon Musk. And there's a dead alive cat in a ballot box called American Democracy as you hear this. But first, the rest of the intro music. Joining me for headlines tonight are my fellow skeptic rats, no illusions, and Eli Bosnick. Gentlemen, we are one day out from election day. <sighs> so let's get this on the record. Will you accept the results of the election? <laughs> I, I, I'm going to wait and see what Dinesh D'Souza's research tells us this Thank time. you. I've been burned yes. before. <laughs> this is Heath's attempt to get me to not write in Joe Biden. And Heath, I told you my decision is <laughs> final. Okay. Right. No, sending a message. That's Movement cool. of the people. That's important. In our lead story tonight, we are all stuck in a bad situation this week. And you've probably heard plenty of hot takes about it. And I think I speak for just about everyone when I say I'm exhausted now. But at its core, the problem is based on a badly conceived anti-democratic, antiquated system that's been making things worse ever since it began. We've seen congressional efforts to get rid of it, but with today's extremely polarized political atmosphere, it's been impossible to find agreement about the details of a better system. Progressives just want to move forward and do what's best for the vast majority of people. But old-timey conservatives want to cling to the old system, often arguing the importance of, you know, representing places like rural America. But the economic data especially is clear. Regardless of where you live, it's setting us back as a country to have this system. Of course, I'm talking about daylight savings time. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's the worst. And the electoral college. I'm talking about both. They both <laughs> have to go. That's that like daylight savings time. At least it's not the racist antiquated system Heath was just talking about. That is the best thing you can possibly say for it at this point. Yeah. Well, and without it, I'd be the only person who hates farmers for no reason. So there's a lot of it's benefits. Not, the farmers guys. hate it too, though. <laughs> no, right, that's what I'm saying. It's their so, fault. I blame them. So yeah, the electoral college and daylight wasting time are both firmly in place, and we're stuck with them right now. In a very sad metaphor of one stupidity imitating another, we fell back as a country yesterday, which we know for a fact is going to lead to negative economic consequences and literal death. And thanks to the Electoral College, we might do the same thing tomorrow if we elect Donald Trump. According to pretty much every statistician, we're looking at a coin flip. But that doesn't have to be the case. Even within the absurd, cheaty, hacky system of the Electoral College, we do have enough people in the right places who align with Kamala Harris way more than they align with Donald Trump. But sadly, some of those people are feeling disillusioned by the Democratic Party, and those people are planning to sit this one out or vote third party, which is the same. And that line of thinking helped us get George W. Bush and mm -hmm. Donald Trump. So mm -hmm. I want to make one last case for voting. And that, okay, that's a crazy sentence I just said. Sure is, but, man. Yeah, but I'm going to put aside my natural instinct, and I'm going to try to do this from a place of empathy. Normally, I'd say something like, you know, get the fuck over yourself and do the right thing. But I'm not going to do that. I'm not saying that. I'm not. A great philosopher once said, you catch more flies with honey than vinegar. And, okay, well, that philosopher is a weird fucking fly hunter. It's so weird that skeptical. he tried vinegar at all. Yeah. yeah. What are you doing there? It's just a lot of weird stuff going on, but I'm going to give it a try. And if you're one of those vinegar loving flies, I'm sure no any Eli can help you out mm -hmm. along the way, mm -hmm. but I'm going to try the opposite because I'm told that people want to be asked nicely. 
So with that in mind, I am offering a pony and a puppy, huh? Pony and a puppy, right? Who doesn't want a pony and a puppy? If you wouldn't mind, if just, you know, if just if you could get to it, if you don't mind doing, you know, the right thing, whenever you get a chance at your leisure at some point tomorrow, I'd be so, so very appreciative. And I will be giving out ponies and puppies while supplies last. <laughs> and like Heath, my idea of what to do with protest voters also involves vinegar and drawing flies. <laughs> right? So like, the whole way that paragraph worked was for us not to interrupt and disagree with Heath. So I've just been sitting here like I'm <laughs> holding my breath. The, just, uh, if you interrupt him, his bit doesn't work. But I want to. Yeah. You could probably hear Eli's body shaking and then yeah. his desk No, Heath will keep it in to the yeah. surround sound experience on iTunes. And here's the thing. You could can vote in a snit. Everybody loves a snit, right? You I can go in there and be like, snit. Kamala Harris, fine, gaw. You can do that. They have to let you. But joking aside, I really do want to make a sincere appeal to the progressives out there who have genuine criticisms of the Democratic Party you're thinking about not voting. And I'm guessing I share some of those opinions. So if you're a progressive-minded person, your political philosophy is heavily defined by a spirit of caring for other people who might be less fortunate than you are. And here's where the empathy comes in. I'd like to weaponize that empathy against you right now. And I don't mean that like as an attack on the philosophy at all. In all seriousness, if you're a progressive, I consider that pretty much synonymous with you're a good person with good morality. And good people are being held hostage by their morality all the time. It's not fair, but it's definitely a virtue to maintain that morality despite the unfairness. As it applies in politics, we're all being held hostage by a two-party system with an electoral college. So given that you're a hostage, so am I, I'm going to throw some guilt at the hostages now. Here's a very much non-exhaustive list of the potential victims of another term for Donald Trump. And when I say potential, I mean definitely. The victims will include people with a uterus, people who love anyone with a uterus, the LGBTQ community, and pretty much anyone who's not a cishet white Christian man. The Supreme Court, it could get even worse. Oh, I thought they were going to get the Supreme Court. You were yeah. you were <laughs> yeah. winning me over to the other side no, for a no, no, no. I was I like, mean, wait, like, wait, wait. <laughs> the quality of the Supreme Court. Oh, okay. Yeah, it could get worse. Or it could fail to get better given the opportunity. And the victims would be, well, anyone subject to laws for the mm -hmm. next several decades, especially the vulnerable people I just mentioned. Also, this is a big one for a lot of people, the people of Palestine. Yeah. You don't have to support anything about the current administration's policy to realize that Donald Trump's policy is decidedly worse for those people. Whatever value you see in withholding a vote from Kamala Harris needs to outweigh the effect of Trump being in charge of our foreign policy regarding Palestine. And that's a terrible, terrible thing that will happen. And of course, another victim, the 99%. The GOP's defining characteristic for decades is economic injustice. And it's led to an ever widening wealth disparity. And Trump took it to a new level with giant tax cuts for the rich and union busting and appointing judges who support all that stuff. So the victims would be approximately 346 million people who need better economic justice. You, you might not be cut out for, you know, breaking kneecaps of scabs and corporate shills with a baseball bat with Eli's grandfather, but Ooh. voting pro-labor is everyone's baseball bat. And just this issue alone, if there's one side that is pro-union and the other side is not, the answer is very clear. Oh, sorry, just one other small one. Uh, one of the victims would be People who live on planet Earth, uh, especially if they rely on air and water. Yeah, no, so, that's how they get you. Yeah, <laughs> that's another victim. All living things on Earth, actually, yeah. Yeah, sure, not even just the people. And listen, okay, I get it. Mu Dang. I'm, I'm just some guy on a podcast. There you go, Mu Dang, great point. But yeah, I'm just some guy on a podcast. I'm certainly not an expert with frontline experience on how to affect progressive change in American politics. But neither are you. You're... 
listening to just some guy on a podcast right now. Regardless, maybe you don't want to take my word for it. If you want to hear some excellent reasoning from a true expert, check out what AOC has been saying recently or what Bernie Sanders has been saying recently. They both have very strong disagreements with the Biden-Harris administration, especially regarding Palestine and Israel. And they've explained how that disagreement can and should coexist with voting for Kamala Harris. During a recent interview, AOC explained that she's not going to punish trans kids in Indiana by withholding a vote. She's not going to punish a single parent who uses EBT and WIC to help feed a family by withholding a vote because that would be truly monstrous. Monstrous, yes. Uh huh. And one other excellent point she made was about the direction the Democratic Party moves based on election outcomes. When there's an extremely tight race in a general election or following a loss in the general, the party moves to the right. But when there's a swell of support from the progressive wing of the party, the party can move to the left. So the idea of exerting leftward pressure by withholding a vote is demonstrably doing the opposite of the intended purpose. And that disempowers people like AOC, which makes it even worse double. Yeah, look, I said this on on Facebook the other day, but if your moral stand requires you abdicate moral responsibility, it's not a moral stand. You lost that word now. It's just a stand. You're just standing. Also worth noting, the Senate and the House could end up controlled by Republicans, very likely at least the Senate. Mm -hmm. But with Kamala Harris in the White House, lots of the inevitable fuckery would get blocked. But if Trump gets handed a trifecta, and he's already got the Supreme Court in his pocket, it's a truly nightmare scenario. Well, it's already a nightmare scenario if he gets elected. So so this is like yeah. five levels deep of nested nightmares, like fucking Inception on Elm Street or something. Yeah, where the blood just comes out of the bed. That's what we're trying to avoid. Yeah, yeah. right. Okay, so again, I get where the instinct is coming from to reject the whole thing. It feels like you're being forced I don't into get participating that. In a rigged game. I was quiet for the other part. Okay, no, no, but like, you're <laughs> right about that. It yes. is a rigged no, game. No, it is, yeah. right. And you don't want to compromise your values. So maybe it feels like a non-vote or a third-party vote is a way of refusing to buy into that unfair system. But here's the thing. The system doesn't need you to buy in. It's already funded. It's happening regardless. It sucks, but it's true. It's happening regardless, just like the stupid fucking clock thing. Like, you can show up an hour early to everything all winter or an hour late to everything all summer, but that's nothing. You're just making it worse for you and, more importantly, worse for the people around you. So to all the true progressives out there, I feel confident that you know in your heart it's not about you. That's your philosophy. It's about other people. And you'll do the right thing because you're a good person. And you might get a pony and a puppy, right? While supplies last. And on that note, we're going to take a quick break for a word from our sponsor, Policy Genius. Okay, and this is 2027. 2027 seems, you know, early. Dude, my triglycerides are like so high. Yeah, okay, fine. I'll, I'll take it. Hey, fellas, what you up to? Yeah, so Eli's giving me um, future Christmas presents, I think. Future Christmas presents. You know, for when I'm not around anymore. Still want to make sure you guys are getting gifts and stuff. Look, Eli, that's really sweet and all, but if you want to make sure your loved ones are taken care of when you're gone, you should try life insurance from Policy Genius. What's Policy Genius? Policy Genius makes finding and buying life insurance simple, so your loved ones have a financial safety net they can use to cover debts and routine expenses or even invest that money to earn interest over time. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for $1 million of coverage. Some options are 100% online and let you avoid unnecessary medical exams. It's true. We've heard from lots of listeners who not only found life insurance through Policy Genius, but also saved a ton of money by comparing to their current coverage online. That's because their licensed support team helps you get what you need fast, so you can get on with your life. They answer questions, handle paperwork, and advocate for you throughout the process. All right, guys, I'm sold. Where do I sign up? Secure your families tomorrow so you have peace of mind today. Head to PolicyGenius.com and click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's PolicyGenius.com. Nice. You know what, Heath? Why don't you go ahead and open that now? 
Wow, really? All right. Check it out. Eli, Eli, this is FIFA. Yeah, and it will be the same game whatever year I die. They make changes to it. Do they, though? It's the, the player names sometimes of the okay. team. They move teams. <laughs> <laughs> And we're back. Next up in headlines in indiscreet cheat tweet news. We don't know yet who's going to emerge victorious on Tuesday, but one thing we can predict with absolute certainty is that at some point in the night, Donald Trump will declare victory. In fact, the worse he's doing, the earlier he'll start saying he won, because as much as we'd all love to think the stress will be over Tuesday night or maybe early Wednesday morning, we learned last time around that even if Kamala emerges victorious, we can't start resting easy until January 6th of 2025 at the earliest. At the earliest, yeah. I feel like Trump and everyone who ever voted for Trump needs to, like, go in escrow until the certification is done. (laughs) (laughs) Right, yeah. But By which I mean, like, a a clown car holding cell would be great. Like, that's the new rule for me. Yeah, I I read the article in the Times this week about the inevitability of this, and their conclusions seem to be, well, at least now he doesn't have the element of surprise. Am I right, everybody? (laughs) Well, no, far from comforting, sure, but that is an advantage, right? Like, we've seen this show before. He spent four years making the election was stolen, the second most eye-roll-inducing assertion after the rapture is coming. Right? So not only do we know that it's coming, we already know more or less how it's coming as well. Uh, We also have the hopefully insurmountable advantage that our side is actually in the White House now, right, as opposed to last time when he was just trying to remain in power. Another advantage we have is the Electoral Count Reform Act. Uh, That's a new law that was passed in late 2022, uh, specifically set to shore up the weak points in the electoral process that Trump tried to exploit in 2020. And one advantage that you can never discount when your opponent is Donald Trump is the sheer vastness of his incompetence, his personal stupidity. There is always a non-zero chance that he's just going to say like, so that's how he conspired to steal the election into a goddamn camera during an (laughs) interview on CNN or something. Okay, so normally I'm against government power being used on a protest but that's not true I, i'm installing <laughs> centuries from the never-ending story all around the capital just to be safe there you, you know? go and for fun yeah that would no, be fun there to watch. a lot of our politicians uh, so all that being said we also have a few major disadvantages this time as well a few new disadvantages for most of which in my opinion is that over the last four years Are you willing to play along with lies about who won the presidential election has become a litmus test for Republican leadership, right? With the exception of Mitch buffering McConnell, I can't think of a single Republican in a leadership position who hasn't at least tacitly endorsed the big lie. They've also seeded the actual election apparatus with their partisans as well. So there's almost certainly going to be some shenanigans on the municipal level, right? Because like everything they've ever accused us of, they've gone on to do themselves or we're already doing. So get ready for them to start trying to sneak thumb drives into vote processing centers with just 27,000 individual Word documents that say Trump on them. (laughs) Pan over to Mike Lindell shoving packets of sugar into a thumb drive. (laughs) (laughs) This is data, right? This is data. It was guaranteed. It's on the writing. Okay, but also, keep in mind that these shenanigans could have consequences outside of that stupid lady getting sent to jail for 10 years, right? So part of the Electoral Reform Act puts time limits on state decisions. So if a bunch of assholes in Pennsylvania are doing dive rolls in front of ballot machines, it could have real consequences for the election, and we don't know what they are. Well, that's yeah, that's the thing, is that it doesn't really spell out what to do if they fuck the fuck around with that, yeah. Let's get those never-ending story things in, the, in for those dive roll guys. Just all, the, all over the place. Yep, yep. Now, they don't but, have jobs now. Perhaps the biggest thing that we have working against us uh, is the level to which social media has abdicated its responsibility when it comes to misinformation this time around, right? Like, leading the way, of course, is Elon does somebody like me now, Musk, who has single-handedly dismantled all the guardrails that were put in place after the 2016 election and the 2020 insurrection on Twitter. Um, and that's left the working standard for all the other social media companies as low as better than Twitter, at least, So both Facebook and YouTube have backpedaled on their previous commitments to fight online information. And as if in a deliberate effort to maximize the effectiveness of the bullshit, Facebook has gone so far as deprioritizing news articles, making it harder to access vetted, trustworthy information. 
Yeah. Hey, apropos of nothing, if you send us a picture of you returning a Tesla for a refund... You could win one million dollars in a sweepstakes. <laughs> what? Oh, a no. million dollars? What? Come and, on. And of course, we're already seeing the early stages of Trump's lie, right? Like it starts with the message that there's no way Trump could lose. He's so far ahead that it would be unthinkable that he would lose without election interference. And and since the polls very clearly do not show that, uh, he and his surrogates have taken to citing betting odds that favor him. Because the people with the most insightful take on things in this country are the people who can't think of a better investment strategy than gambling. But they're putting out that overwhelming lead message to low information supporters, which is redundant when you're talking about Trump supporters, I guess. And Musk is doing his part, amplifying the shit out of that on the website that Harry and Lloyd sold him. Yeah. <laughs> a really good example of my genuine pessimism is that right now, as we record this, Robin Hood is offering a dollar for every 63 cents bet against fascism. And I am not taking that bet. Yeah. Think about how fucking awful this country is that I am not taking what should absolutely be free money. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so the next step after selling that lie is it's a two-parter that Eli's already alluded to. On the one hand, they do everything possible to delay the counting of the votes. And on the other, they point to those delays in vote counting as signs that something nefarious must be going on. It's something nefarious other than the thing that they're doing that I'm talking about. All the while, they find the actual minor errors and mistakes that are bound to happen when an entire 350 million person nation tries to vote and pretend that those are proof that the whole thing is rigged. And, and we're actually already seeing a bit of that with fraudulently obtained registrations in Pennsylvania having been telephone gamed into fraudulently submitted ballots, which is a way different thing. Yeah, and hey, I'll give you two guesses which side was doing that fraud, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'm uh, above nothing. Uh, if you send us a video of you leading an Oath Keeper away from a Red County ballot box that he's guarding with dive rolls using a trail of candy, you could win $1 million oh, in a shit. Put it what? on Twitter. Um, all right, so, and again, I, I have to remind everyone, this that I'm talking about, this is the better possible outcome on Tuesday, right? Yeah. This is actually the future we want of, of the two available. But when it happens, it's largely going to fall to us skeptics to keep the insanity at bay. Right. We're the ones best equipped to identify logical fallacies, trace information back to its source, debunk conspiracy theories and reason with unreasonable people. And as much as I know, we're all going to want to just tune out at that point. This might just be the point where our toughest job starts. So fucking sorry to be the one to break that to you. And next up in headlines in Des Moines, you know, news. <laughs> Des Moines, Iowa celebrated its first Halloween since 1938 this week. And while I don't know how the right is going to pretend it resulted in voter fraud, somehow <laughs> it is. So we're going to talk about it. Hey, listeners, the way Eli wrote Des Moines, you know, in the notes had me scratching my head for so fucking long before I just moved on and realized that this was a story about Des Moines, Iowa. He, yeah. just, it, he has <laughs> demo in, you know, and I'm like, what it's is the, he going it's the context for? clues that matter? Yeah. yeah. So uh, if you weren't aware, Des Moines hasn't done Halloween on Halloween since 1938. Why, Why, you ask? Thank you, Heath. Hooliganism, which in 1938 probably meant like not wearing a four-piece suit while trick-or-treating or something, but whatever the reason, they instituted the far more problematically named Beggar's Night, where what? kids go from house to house asking for candy the night before Halloween. So... <laughs> Hooliganism problem it's solved. Nothing. All right. With yet another point of evidence in my contention that Des Moines is the opposite of Detroit. Yeah, I get it, though. I celebrate Christmas on the 24th for atheism Yo, right ooh, in their face. And it yeah. totally works. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, Eli, that sounds just like Halloween, but on a different day. Well, no. Children are also expected on beggars night to tell a joke in order to get their treat. So it's got a weird. Gong show for candy element that is demonstrably worse <laughs> like than it. Halloween. We want them greedy fuckers to earn it. We ain't just giving away <laughs> our candy. 
Come on. The gong show with the jokes, that's awesome. Just kids going up to a door being like, hello, you're a grown-up who chooses to live in Iowa. I'm a child. Give me a fucking Snickers. There you go. <laughs> Boom, yeah, you're the joke. You you're okay. the joke. But to this year, because you might be thinking, Eli, what happened? Did Des Moines decide to catch up with the times? Were heckles and boos too much for this soft generation of candy munchers to take? Well, no. It was that Wednesday got rained out, so they <laughs> did it on Thursday. Amazing. <laughs> kind of anticlimactic to know, but now you have a fun fact that is not election news to share around the water cooler today and tomorrow, right? It's a nice little break <laughs> between the screams. You're welcome, there you go. podcast listener. And in Gross Point Spank news, Tucker Carlson delivered uh, something last week. Mm hmm. I feel like it was intended to be a positive speech about Donald Trump, but the normal words for describing a political speech do not apply. What actually happened was a literal psychosexual fugue state. Oh, it was, though. I feel like we've <laughs> abused that term so people don't understand that's actually this one <laughs> for real, like literally that he set up a metaphor in which America is an unruly child. And Donald Trump is daddy, exact word. And daddy is going to spank us. And it wasn't like the classy, dignified, cogent version of an authoritarian political spanking metaphor that you might be imagining. It was sexual and yep. psycho. Yeah. No, it was it was so fucking creepy that you can do a whole intro about how creepy it is without mentioning that while America is getting spanked in this analogy, it is a teenage girl. Yeah, that was important to him. Sure is. And a big thanks to nobody for sending the story to skepticratnews at gmail.com. <laughs> Everybody needs to D the fuck up. If I didn't have a Google alert for Tucker Carlson's psychosexual fugue state, very specifically, we might have missed this. <laughs> this is true. He does. So... Here's what we got from Tucker at the rally. It was in Duluth, Georgia. And just for context, keep in mind that Tucker is the father of three daughters. You don't like to see it. He started by setting up the insane metaphor and framing the United States under the leadership of Donald Trump as a naughty little girl. But she kept her behavior in check because of Trump and his bigly dad energy. And if you ever saw Donald Trump interact with his daughter Ivanka, it's no surprise where Tucker goes from there. Tucker said, quote, if you allow your hormone addled 15 year old daughter to slam the door and give you the finger, you're going to get more of it. I OK, it feels backwards. Like if you slam the door and then give the finger, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't, need to doesn't do, do a little. Good. Either way, he continued. There has to be a point at which dad comes home. End quote. And then in the creepiest applause break of all time, the crowd of Trump supporters went crazy and started cheering. Dad comes home. It was so fucking weird. If Heath had been there and he had started chanting, who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? <laughs> the crowd around him genuinely would not know whether to chant along or not. That's true. Yeah. From there, Tucker ramps up the crazy somehow. Buckle the fuck in. Tucker continued. Dad comes home and he's pissed. He's not vengeful. He loves his children. Disobedient as they may be, he loves them. And when dad gets home, you know what he says? You've been a bad girl. You've been a bad little girl and you're getting a vigorous spanking right now. The word vigorous is doing so yeah, much terrible work. It makes work it in so that. much creepier. creepier. These are real quotes, by the way. So, and add the word little. A bad little yeah. girl also. It's, yeah. uh, he continued, and no, it's not going to hurt me more than it hurts you. I'm not going to lie. It's going to hurt you a lot more than it hurts me. And you earned this. You're getting a vigorous spanking because you've been a bad girl and it has to be this way. End exact quote. Okay. I feel, let me, let me venture something brave. I feel like Tucker was just like getting spanked by his dom. And then he was like, you know what? I don't have to stay up late working on my speech. I'm going to take, take Chris's Siri, thing. Siri, talk to type. When this, uh, yeah. I mean, I'll ask him when he takes the ball gag out, but this is what I think I'm going to do. I'm going to do that. Yeah. So that was the warm up act for Donald Trump. And when he finally took the stage, the crowd chanted, 
daddy's home, daddy's Jesus. home over and it was just truly terrifying. And listen, I know there's a giant list of crazy, creepy, absurd things from speakers at Trump events. During Trump's rally at Madison Square Garden last week, we got a hacky roast comedian calling Puerto Rico an island of garbage, and we got Rudy Giuliani having a fucking 15-minute keynote meltdown about how he got ordered by a judge to almost exactly sell off all your earthly possessions. That's the law now. <laughs> Not my father's New York Yankee ring. <laughs> oh, my New York Yankee ring. But, but here's the thing. Don't let all that stuff dilute the very real message from Tucker Carlson, who actually did, I believe, correctly capture Donald Trump's energy. A physically abusive, psychosexual dad, the political philosopher. <laughs> and... I don't know the exact rules in Georgia, but it feels like it has to be true that everybody at that rally needs to be going door to door like Megan's Law. Oh, now. yeah. Big time. <laughs> for sure. And in Cheddar Off Dead news, you know, we report on a variety of stories here at The Skeptocrat. Good news, weird news, sad news that we feel the need to speak up about. But this week, I have a story that just might mean the end of Puzzle in the Thunderstorm as we know it. I'm talking, of course about the theft of 22 metric tons of award-winning cheddar cheese that just happened to go <laughs> missing in London when Noah was there. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, Noah, if it wasn't you, now we need to steal it from the Stealers. And yes. Sweet this is our Italian job. All right. Now I'm going to ruin your Christmas present for Heath. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, well, that's not well, the Italian job, by the way. That was fucking lock, stock, and two smoking barrels. So that's the one. That is the one. Correct. Thank you. <laughs> oh, actually, you know what? It. They did do that. In, yeah, never mind. Never mind. They did it in Italian. Stop playing job, with so. my heart. Yeah, no illusions. No, you're right. You're right. Stop toying with my emotions. <laughs> Yeah, so while details have been thin on the ground, here's what we know. A con artist posing as a wholesale distributor for a major French retailer placed a large order for a tremendous number of 50-pound wheels of cloth-wrapped, award-winning cheddar. And Niels Yard Dairy, the supplier, had delivered almost a thousand of those wheels before the fraud was discovered. But by then... It was too late. The thieves had stolen away with their tank, and the dairy was out hundreds of thousands of British pounds of product. Okay, I've said this many times before. This is why you always chip your cheese. That's a really <laughs> mistake. An apple tag, people. Yep. Come on. All we're saying Monterey though, is... Monterey Lojack. <laughs> <laughs> All right, all we're saying, though, is if you happen to be a Boski, a Jim Brown, a Miss Daisy, a Jeff Rowe, a Leon <laughs> Spinks, or the biggest Ella Fitzgerald ever, apply within. Yeah, exactly. Now, there is some good news here. Uh, a few local cheese retailers who thought they were getting, like, a good buy on the down low have returned some of the stolen goods. Uh, celebrity chef Jamie Oliver has joined the hunt, and an arrest of a 63-year-old man has been made, and he was questioned by Scotland Yard. So whoever Noah set up to be his patsy obviously fell for it. And as long as nobody in a deerstalker hat enters the case, I think your podcast <laughs> enjoyment is safe for now. And finally tonight, in reading the fine print news, a Russian court has found the next least credible number after a gajillion by issuing a <laughs> fine against Google's parent company in the amount of... <clears throat> 20 million million billion trillion dollars. That's so stupid. Okay. That's the real number. It is a it two is. with 34 zeros after it. <laughs> Apparently, there's a name for that. That's 20 decillion dollars. And yes, it is considerably more than all the money that exists in the world, both real and theoretical, by a factor <laughs> of about a million trillion. So, you know, that ought to teach them. This is fun. I looked up the story on Bing, and it just says at the top of the page, well, well, well. <laughs> okay, but we can all admit that Russia has gone from, like, dangerous world superpower to toddler that needs psychological intervention, yeah. right? Like, next you're going to tell me they're turning challenging adults into jack-in-the-boxes. Right, but that's the thing. It's a toddler that needs psychological intervention and has nuclear weapons. And has nukes and is conducting a war. Yeah. Yes, right. Yeah. So this laughable fine stems from Google's decision to ban a number of Russian channels from YouTube after they blatantly violated the site's terms of service. Or Actually, no, sorry. They weren't banned. They just had some of their content restricted. 
first over the 2020 elections in, in the U.S. and then later over the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So 17 companies that had content block got together and they sued Google and a Russian court thought they were going to really get Google's attention by, I guess, just holding their finger down on the zero key until it <laughs> filled the whole line. OK, I hope Google really leans into this, you know, like set up an account and be like, yeah, there's 20 decillion dollars in the account. But the captcha to sign in is like 20 decillion photos that might have a bike in them. Oh. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Plus, Russia already has Yorgi. Do you see a horse dot com, which is way more useful for their purposes? Yeah, no, that's you fair. Know? Yeah. Now, the reason that the fine has increased to an amount where astronomical would genuinely be an understatement is that it's apparently exponentially increasing all the time. And I have never regretted my lack of math acumen more than I do because I really want to tell you how long it would take for this fine against Google to reach a Google. But <laughs> according to Putin's press secretary, Dmitry Peskov, who admits that he can't even pronounce the number in this fine, quote, the sum is filled with symbolism. These demands demonstrate the essence of our channel's grievances, end quote. <laughs> hmm. so, so there you have it. The number is just like the grievances of Russian propaganda mills. Ridiculous, overblown, and hard to pronounce. Yeah. I would like our court's decisions to be more symbolic, though. I think that would be nice, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, election day's tomorrow. Fucking do it. On that note, <laughs> we're going to close it out. He's staggering out of the podcast like <sighs> a drunk guy who has talked himself All into right, a All right, here fight. we fucking go. Let's do the American <laughs> democracy. It's going great. It's going great. Thanks to Noah. Thanks to Eli. And thank you seriously to all the listeners who liked us and followed us on all the various internets. Please keep doing that. Please keep listening. And please keep telling your friends to vote wait, in swing states. What was the seriously? The, so the thanks to me and Eli were unserious? Yeah! I, what, why did I, was, I was never thought of that moving, before. Moving away from my drunk, <laughs> drunk name. You know what? You don't have to vote. <laughs> the segue, it mind. was adjacent to a couple. Of, it doesn't matter. If you find the naive stupidity of our giving away a free show business model to be oddly charming, you can send us gifts of money at patreon.com slash skeptocrat. Just like Curio Hall, Ipswich, Word of the Broad, Laura Kelly, The Mighty Adam, with an exclamation, William Boisvert, Mark Coles, Ben the Heretique, Naomi Wheeler, Michael Sparaccio, Soul, James Shannon, Kelly Slate, Wesley Harney, Never Spent, Dustin Duggar, Roger Odell, and Ryan McCarrigan. You are the Reese's Peanut Butter Cups of people, and we... Love you. I ate so many Reese's at Halloween party oh, yesterday. Oh, yeah. Fuck. They're so oh, good. They're always, the and can I say, they're always perfect. They're You've never had so a Reese's good. peanut butter cup and been like, oh, that wasn't a good one. No. No. Nope. Every all time. Identical? Yeah. Every time. I could do with that. Like real Americans. <laughs> and whether or not you're feeling financially benevolent like those fine people, if you enjoyed our brand of whimsy and you'd like to hear more dick jokes free of charge, check out our brother and sister shows, The Scathing Atheist, God Awful Movies, DD Minus, and Citation Needed. Available in all the podcast places. We just have one last thing. Let's compliment that penis. Special thanks to Ryan Slotnick of Evil Giraffes on Mars. He's the creator of the virtuosic musical stylings you heard today, which were used with permission. You should definitely check him out using the links we we'll provide or by Googling the only band called the Evil Giraffes on Mars. Until next time, fucking vote. Male okay. orgasms. And nope. <laughs> the preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm LLC, copyright 2024, all rights reserved.